We appreciate very much the presence of each one here this afternoon. We'd like to welcome you uh, to this Assembly of the Lord's House. Uh, again, I'm very happy to be able to be here, and I appreciate another opportunity to be your speaker. Just for a little while this evening, I'd like to talk about a series of verses that I used to puzzle over. I'd look at these verses, and I'd read them, and I'd think I knew something about it. And the more I thought about it, I began to wonder, is that something that seems like it is? You know, most of the Bible seems just like it is. And I thought, that's exactly what that is. Uh, the verses I want to tell you about is found in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. And I'm going to read there beginning of verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all may be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like if a person shows that he prefers error to truth, God will allow him to have his error. And you know, by the way, that's exactly what that means. If a person shows that he's not interested in having the truth, he doesn't have to have it. God will allow him to have whatever he wants. Now, this has helped me to understand situations which otherwise I don't have a good answer for. This has helped me to be able to, to understand how people think and how people work, especially about Bible things. And uh, I hope it'll do that for you. I hope this is something that you already know everything about. But in case you don't, it's a very interesting thing. Now, let's begin. And let's talk about the idea of what is a strong delusion. What's a delusion? Well, I read a couple of more um, translations of the Bible. For instance, the American Standard, which is considered to be a pretty good translation of the Bible. And it says, for this cause, God sendeth them a working of error, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. American Standard says, this is a working of error, that they might believe whatever they want to believe. Now, Mr. Goodspeed, in his translation, he says it like this. This is why God sends upon them a misleading influence. What is this? This is a working of error. This is a misleading influence. This is a delusion. And how does it work? Well, there's certain, uh, a certain pro progress that has to happen. And here's what he says. And I'm going to write these up here on the board. And I want to put them somewhere where we can all see them. First of all, the person who is subject to an illusion, he knows the truth. Or he knows the source of the truth. He knows what he is supposed to understand. In other words, it is something which he has within his mind or his understanding. But look at secondly, there's a second thing that he uh, has to do. He doesn't want what he knows. So he rebels against it. Uh, uh, the idea is that this is something that he doesn't want. And so he rejects it. And I find this is something again that is going to lead him into a bad situation. What's next? He knows he doesn't want it. Next, he'll receive a strong delusion. A strong delusion. There's the progress. Knows. Doesn't want it. Doesn't have to have it. He'll receive whatever he wants. Now what happens? He is going to be condemned. Or, as our scripture read, he is going to be damned. I'm going to write it just like the Bible says it because that's what I want to understand about this. The delusion comes to those who prefer not to know it, and it is something which is going to cause them to be lost. Now, tonight, I'd like to keep this in a reasonable amount of time, so I want to talk about three different ways that man is deluded. And this is, as I said, has helped me to understand, which otherwise I don't have a good explanation for. I'm going to write these right over here. And for instance, I find that there are many people who are deluded about God. Now, if you were with us last night, we talked a little bit about the idea of God, and uh, we went into some of the idea that uh, there are people who reject the concept of God. But you know what? This has helped me to understand this even to a greater degree. When I went to school, I was a biology major. Biology is the life science. And for some reason, which I'll never understand, uh, the college where I went, they hired a Yankee from Michigan to come down and teach us biology. And you know, he was opposed to anything that had to do with God. 
uh, he made fun of all of us, the class, and there was a, a big class, and he'd stand up there and mock us, and he'd say the idea of God is for weaklings and such as that. The idea of God is something which is for people uh, that are not educated. He was trying, you see, to talk us out of the idea of God. Is that anything new? That's not new at all. As a matter of fact, this has helped me to understand something which otherwise I can't explain. Do you understand why there's such a thing in the Bible as the Jews or the Israelites, the people of God by their birthright, and then there's everybody else, the Gentiles? That's, that's us. Why are there such a thing in the Bible as the Jews and the Gentiles? Did God look down here on this world and said, all you guys that are Jews, I just love y'all. And I'm going to give you all the special breaks and I'm going to give you everything that you never dreamed you would have. And everybody else, I'm sorry, got nothing for you. All you other nations, and that's what the word Gentile means, you're on your own. Is that the way it was? Wasn't that the way at all? As a matter of fact, from the beginning, uh, all mankind had the same opportunity. And this idea is found in the first chapter of the book of Romans. The apostle Paul is writing this to the Gentiles. And he wants them to know exactly what happened to them. Uh, let me read a little bit of this so that you can see how the Gentiles came into being. The Bible says in Romans 1, at beginning of verse 19, Because that which may be known of God, make a little check right there, that which may be known of God is manifested to them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are, uh, that are made even his eternal power and Godhead. So they're without excuse. Now, friends, I couldn't write that any plainer if I were to try to put it in my own words. It simply says the things of God were clearly seen from the beginning of creation. He showed it unto mankind. They had no excuse. I think I said this already. You may hear it again. There is no excuse for anybody being an atheist. None whatsoever. Because God has showed, it unto, showed himself unto us. And uh, what do we have to do? Well, let's see what the Gentiles did. Going on to verse 21. Because that... When they knew God, they, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What happened? They knew God, number one. They didn't want to, knew God, to know God. As a result of that, their foolish heart was darkened. They were deluded. What else happens? Well, let's go a little bit further. I find going on in verse 28, it says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They didn't want to keep God on their mind. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And look what happens. Going on down at verse 23. Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. And the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. On and on it goes and it just gets darker and worse as you get along with it. Uh, man shows that he prefers uh, not to recognize God. And if you don't want to recognize God, you don't have to. But just remember, there is a strong delusion. Your foolish heart will be darkened. You'll be glad to wind up with a reprobate mind. And what happened to the, Jew, to the Gentiles? They turned to idolatry. That's how it happened. That's how it was that Israel accepted God. The rest of the nations did not. And it caused a major division in all of humanity at that particular time. How did it come back? By a strong delusion. Those who did not want to know about God. Now, I've said all that to give you the background for what I'm going to tell you about this teacher that we had. He had a doctor's degree in biology. And like I said, biology is the life science. And yet, he would not recognize God at all. And uh, because he was the, had us as a captive audience, he'd tell us all sorts of things, like I mentioned a minute ago, that we were all ignorant, that we're unlearned, that the ideas of the Bible are a bunch of old wives' tales, and on and on and on. And we just sat there, supposedly, and swallowed it down. Now, he should have known better than that, because most of his crowd were God believers. Most of them profess some type of Christianity. And it was something which we were all awestruck with how ignorant he was. Now let me tell you something about biology. You can take the skin 
off of an onion. You know that little thin skin on the outside of an onion? You get that, uh, that thin skin and you get you a microscope. The microscope doesn't have to be very powerful. As a matter of fact, you can do this with a little tin power play microscope if you happen to have one of those. And you look at this onion skin through that microscope and you know what you'll see? You'll see chaos and disorganization and all sorts of uh, things out of control? No, you won't. You will see the cells in that onion skin laid together like bricks in a wall. They show a perfection there that a little onion skin you wouldn't expect. They're like blocks, if you want to look at it like that. All of them built one upon the next. You know what they show? They show God and His creative ability. They demonstrate God. I had a discussion with a man last summer, and he was one who didn't want to believe in God, and he was doing the best he could to keep from it. But you know, we were sitting out on his patio, and uh, there was a brick wall around the patio, and after he showed himself to be a fool, I said, you know how those bricks got in that wall? He didn't want to answer. I said, they were laying out there in the stack, and all of a sudden there was a big, and they just went in that wall just like they are now. He said, you know what didn't happen? I said, I sure do. Somebody put those bricks in order. How about the little cells in the onion skin? There's God showing himself to us. Somebody laid those cells in that onion skin. And that's just a minor little detail. We could go on and on and on and talk about all the wonders of creation. But I'm going to sum it like this. Psalms 19 verse 1. The heaven declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Look about you friends. Open up your eyes and God will be able to be seen by you in the fact of his creation. This is something which is not hard for us to understand. Uh, I like to look at it, I think I've already used this too. Uh, you can get out here, and y'all live in a pretty part of the United States. All these green hills around here, and I suppose in early spring, you got a lot of the spring flowers growing in the bar ditches or your highways. Look at those spring flowers growing there. What does that show you? Well, I, I guess that's a flower. No, it's not just a flower, that shows God. And I find that's something that the Bible talks about there in Romans, the first chapter. He has revealed himself unto us. And the one I like, and you already know this one too, is these little babies. There's one right over there. There's a little girl sitting right over there. Uh, if you get a chance and you want to take a chance, look her in the face and see what you see. You'll see God. But now, if you don't want to see him, you don't have to, but there's a penalty. Now this professor I'm telling you about, uh, he's not an atheist anymore. He died. Can you think about that? You die and step off into eternity to stand before Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in judgment, someone that you worked as hard as you could to deny can't even think about something like that. But that's exactly what the Bible tells me. So in Romans 1 at verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Uh, Psalms 14 verse 1, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. How is that? Who is this? It's a fool. He said in his heart, there is no God. With all the evidence, all the proof all around him, he could see it. But he didn't want to. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Let's try another one. There's another way I find that people have been deluded. And this one uh, is, is like this. That is the commands of God. You know, God has given us certain commandments. And there have been people down through the ages who've been deluded by the commandments of God. And I'm going to talk about some of these. The first one, and this has helped me to understand some things, uh, has to do with a story that you're probably familiar with. Uh, Israel is in Egyptian bondage. had been in, in Egyptian bondage for several hundred years, begging God to save them. And finally the time comes when God chooses Moses to become the leader for Israel. Now, uh, Egypt has got a leader. They call their leaders the pharaohs, as like the king or the president or any other person that's in control. And Pharaoh, he is opposed 
to anything God wants to do with Israel. And God tells Moses and his brother Aaron, go in there and tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. Now, what happens? Pharaoh knows what he's supposed to do. He is heard from a man of God. Let my people go that they may serve me. You reckon he's going to do anything like that? Well, <clears throat> let's see. And we will, we'll maybe learn something right here. Uh, because we find out that Pharaoh is not about to let Israel go. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 5. I'm going to read beginning of verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in under, and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. That's important. Where did this come from? Out of the head of Moses? Out of the head of Aaron? No, this came from God. Look here. Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. There's the issue. Turn up loose. Let them go out in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither would I let Israel go. Not going to do it. What's that? He knows what the word is. Let my people go. He's not going to do it. What's he set up for? Delusion. And this is one of the things that I used to, when I was a kid, I used to think about it. Uh, there's a certain number of plagues that rained rain down upon the land of Egypt. And these plagues begin there in Exodus chapter 7. And I want to start there for what we're going to notice out of it. In Exodus chapter 7, uh, the Bible tells us, beginning there at verse 10, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, they did so as the Lord had commanded. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. I guess what I like that, you know, that's about snakes and sticks and uh, snakes swallowed up rods and so on. And I used to read that. And I remember one time I went to a preacher. I said, what happened there? What happened? Uh, how was it that the magicians of Egypt could duplicate the miracles of God? And he said, well, that's not what really happened. This is one of our preachers. I will never forget this. He said, that's an illusion. Aaron goes in and he has a rod. A rod's a dead stick that they use for walking. He throws his stick down on the ground and it became a serpent. Snake. That's an illusion. An illusion. And then the magicians of Egypt, they come in with their rods, cast them down on the ground, and they became serpents. An illusion. But there's one little hitch here. Moses or Aaron's rod swallowed up Pharaoh's rods, serpents. Aaron's rods, uh, serpents, swallowed up Pharaoh's serpents. Now, can you swallow up an illusion? This is not an illusion. This is a delusion with signs. The signs are God performs a miracle through Aaron, and the magicians of Pharaoh do the same thing with signs. And I read, if you remember in our text, that there would be signs and so on. This was what, exactly what happened. The, du the miracles of God were duplicated by Pharaoh's magicians. And as a result of that, the Bible says Pharaoh's heart was darkened. And you know, he died as a result of all this. He resisted the commandments of God. Now, there are a lot of things I could have told you about, but I'm going to tell you what, about one that's near and dear to my heart that I used to, was pretty hard on and pretty rough about. I have a friend. I still have a friend that I had all through school. This friend's name is Gary. And Gary and I have been buddies since high school. Uh, he is a hunter and a fisherman just like I like to do. We fished and hunted together a lot. Gary is a good religious person. Uh, he is religious, and you'll know more about this in a minute, and uh, he would never embarrass you out in crowd. He would never say anything that you thought was wrong. He would never do anything that was considered to be sinful. Me and Gary, we really got along. And over the years, I tried to convert him. 
Matter of fact, I would have just done anything I could to convert him. We were that much friends. And time went along and got to the point, I thought, you know, this is not going to go on much longer. We were both graduating from school and going our separate ways. So one day I saw Gary and I said, could we study together one more time? And he said, I guess so. Now, you know why I asked him to study one more time? Because he's my friend. That's why. You know why he agreed to study with me one more time? Because I'm his friend. That's how this got together. So I'm going to be very careful because this is probably going to be the last opportunity that I have. And I had a big sheet of paper and we were at my kitchen table. And I said, now, Gary, I want you to look at this and I want you to notice uh, what I have to say about this idea. Because this is something which is terribly important. Uh, our hitch was he didn't think baptism was necessary for salvation. He was a member of a large denomination. They did not teach anything about baptism being necessary. So I wanted to make this easy. I said, look here. And I took the paper and I said, let me tell you what you can do. You can take a sinner. And the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can teach that sinner the gospel. And um, I did it like this. I said, you know, if you can cause him to believe in Jesus, uh, he can be saved. That's a, that's a requirement that we believe in Jesus Christ. And my friend said, you know I believe in Jesus. I said, you know, you need to repent. The Bible tells us in Acts uh, uh, 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. He said, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can to live the Christian life. I, I've repented. I said, you know, you need to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew 10 at verse 32, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. He said, you know, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now we're down to our hitch. And I said, you need to be baptized. And I put it on our little chart like this. You need to be baptized. The sinner needs to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in water for the mission of his sins. And I began to write it down, and here's, here's basically what I did. I started in Acts 2, verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I went to the next verse I wanted to talk about, and this is Acts 22, verse 16. He said, And now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Galatians 3, verse 27. I went on through and began to talk about other things. Uh, he tells us, For as many of you, as, Galatians 3, 27, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. That's the way that we become part of the body of Christ. I said, you know, the Bible is uh, every act of conversion, the book of Acts, it always mentions baptism. But look at this. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What is that? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. I said, you know, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, in a like figure, baptism does also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You want to have a good conscience toward God? Would you like to go home from this assembly tonight with the assurance that you can lay your head down on your pillow and sleep the best sleep you ever slept in all your life because you're right in the sight of God? You've got a good conscience. The answer to that good conscience is baptism. Now this is just a few of them. But that's what I had written down. Now then, I turned that around to him at the table and I said, look at this, Gary. And he looked at it. I could tell he didn't want to answer. He didn't want to talk. He just looked at it. And here's what he said. I don't see it. I don't see it. Now how is that possible? At one time I would have thought, and I probably showed this in the way I dealt with some denominational people, I would have thought he was a liar. Or I would have thought he was just jerking me around. Or I would have thought of any number of things. 
But the idea he couldn't see it. Y'all want to know what I think tonight? I don't think he sees it. He does not see it. Now I have to ask you this. Can you see it? Can you see the need for a sinner to be baptized for the mission of sins? To wash his sins away? To put him in Christ? To allow him to be saved? To give him a good conscience toward God? Do you see that? Now if you don't, you might ought to wake up. There's probably other things you don't see either. Why don't people see that? They know it. There it is right there. They don't want to know it. And if you don't want to know it, you don't have to. But you'll be condemned as a result. Now there's an example of those who resist the commandments of God. There are several ways that this might be pointed out. There are several things that we might be able to mention with this uh, uh, idea. I'm going to find a place here on the board. I'm going to put something else. Because uh, there's another way that many, many people are deluded. If you'll be here with us on the Lord's Day... <clears throat> you'll find out that we're very careful as the way that we set the Lord's table. We're very careful about it because we understand the Bible teaches us that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And here's what we'll do. We'll set the Lord's table and we'll set it um, like this. Uh, on the Lord's table, we'll do what Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 26. Jesus took bread. That's what we'll do. What did Jesus do? He took bread. He said, this is my body. When we look at the Lord's table, and there's that loaf of un unleavened bread, Leonard, just one, by the way. How many bodies did Jesus give? Just one. And that loaf represents that one body. When we take of the bread, the communion of the body of Christ, we see the body of Christ like we're supposed to. Look at verse 27. He said Jesus took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now this is a beautiful picture. And you don't want to separate the cup and the contents. The contents is grape juice. What did Jesus say? This cup is the New Testament. Look here. The cup represents to us the New Testament. In my blood. What is the blood? This fruit of the vine represents the blood of Jesus. Now what if you have more than one container? Do we have more than one New Testament? No. The symbolism's ruined. Jesus went on to say, this do in remembrance of me. Now when you look at the Lord's Supper like this, it is a beautiful thing. It reminds us of what the Lord has done. He gave His body for us. He uh, gave uh, the opportunity to bring the New Testament in existence by His blood. Now, if you mess that up, you lose what it represents. Now, I can see that. Can you see that? You know, there are many, many people who are willing to, escape, to totally forget about the Lord's Supper. Are there many more who want to use plurality of loaves or plurality of cups? There's even some that want to change the contents. Is that okay? No, that's not okay. What happens? Here's what the Bible says, and we can know this. He took the bread. He took a cup containing grape juice. Uh, he explains what it is. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. And it always amazes me that people cannot see the institution of the Lord's Supper with one loaf and one cup containing grape juice, but they can see a plurality of loaves and a, some of the old preachers used to call it a wash nest full of little cups rattling around through the congregation. They can see that, and they call that individual communion. Let me tell you something about individual communion. You cannot have individual communion. Individuals by yourself Communion is joint participation. Whenever you violate this right here, the uh, joint participation is gone. So we have one loaf and one cup containing grape juice. I hope you can see that. Because that's something which is very plainly taught in the Lord's will. But as I said, there are many who cannot see it. Now, I have another one here. And this one, I told you there was signs signs even today. 
that lead to delusion. Uh, back home at Ada, Oklahoma, where I live, for over 30 years, we had a radio program. I was on a radio program every Sunday morning at 9.45, 15 minutes uh, until 10 o'clock. And I did that for 30 years. Now, we had mixed results, I'll have to say. It just it didn't set the world on fire, but we had some regular listeners. And when I was home on a Sunday morning, uh, I was off in meetings a lot of times, I would listen to the radio program. And I'd get my little Bible, and I'd sit down in hopes that somebody would call. Maybe somebody will call this morning and have a good question. And I'd be sitting there the, listening to the phone. One Sunday morning, program goes off. Bang, it's over. And ding-ling, phone rings. And I reached over and picked up the phone. And there was a, apparently a young woman on the other end. She said, Brother Hassel? I said, yeah. She said, I just love your program said, you've got the best program on, on KADA. Uh, that's a just, I listen to you every Sunday. And the stuff that you talk about is just wonderful. And you're just enlightening to me and encouraging to me. And, and I said, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't say that, you know, because I know there's something coming. And uh, then she said, I want to ask you a question. What do you think about me being called to preach? There it is. What I heard being called to preach. I said, you know, it doesn't make any difference what I think. Nothing at all. Let me read to you what the Bible says about it. And I had my little testament in my hand. And I started out like this. I said in 1 Corinthians in chapter 14, beginning of verse 34, we find that the Bible uh, has something to say about this. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. What about this? They're commanded to be under obedience. Women are not to speak in a church. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Not only is she not to speak, it is a shame for her to speak in the church. He makes that just about as plain as anybody could expect. And she started, started around. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You call me now. Let me give you one other verse. And then I'll let you say anything you want to. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible says down there at verse 11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay. She knows now. You know what she said? I don't care what that says. I know I got it. You know what I know? I know she got it too. Uh, I don't know what it, a call to preach is for a woman. But she got it. Did she get it from God? No. He said you don't teach in the church. It's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Be silent in the church. She got it, though. She knows. What did she get? She got what she wanted. She knows what the Bible says. She doesn't want that. She got what she wanted. Whatever that is. Now, that's real. And that's something which is a very common thing. And this young lady that I was talking to was in that situation. She had rejected the teachings of God's Word and she had gotten what she wants. Last of all for tonight, there's another way in which men are deluded and this is in the judgments of God. The judgments. You know, God has given certain judgments and uh, there are people who resist these. The one I'd like to use for an example, uh, again, this is another Old Testament uh, example. It's found over in 1 Kings. And, and I'm just going to most, mostly rehearse this for you because it's a pretty long story with a lot of convoluted ideas. But I'm going to tell you about it pretty quickly. Uh, the people we want to talk about is old King Ahab. Ahab's a wicked and mean king. The only thing that tops him is his wife. He's got a wife that's more wicked than he is. Her name is Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel were a pair. And Ahab, um, there was a little guy who owned a vineyard or a little garden that laid right up against the palace. His name was Naboth. And Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. So he went over to Naboth and he tried to buy it. 
And Naboth explained, it's not for sale. I can't sell it. Really, he couldn't sell it. He'd inherited this down through his home, his family lineage, and he wasn't supposed to sell it. He says, I'm not going to sell it. Ahab got so upset and mad about the whole situation, he went in back in the palace and threw himself down on his bed with his face to the wall and began to pout. Finally, um, Jezebel, she sees what's going on, and she goes in and she said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I, I wanted Naboth's vineyard, and he won't sell it. He's not going to let me have it. Well, as me. And Jezebel, being a woman of action, she said, you wait right here. She went outside and she hired some of the sons of Belial. You know who that is? Sons of the devil. That's who that is. That's who Belial is. She goes out and hires some of the sons of the devil to bring up charges against Naboth that he's blasphemed the king. So they did. And as a result of this, Naboth's taken outside of the gates of the city and stoned to death. And Jezebel goes back at it and said, it's yours. I got it for you. Well, things went along and we find out one day that um, Ahab is out in the cool of the evening strolling around through his new garden. And uh, he looks down the road and you know what he sees coming? He sees his worst nightmare coming down the wall of the road. This is Elijah coming. I hope you appreciate Elijah for the type of character he is. Here comes Elijah, and he's um, double-timing it down the road. And he walks right up to, Na uh, to Ahab, and I can just see him walking up into Ahab's face, and he says, the dogs are going to lap up your blood the same place they lapped up poor Naboth's. Now that just ruined a stroll in the garden, wouldn't it? What is he saying? You're going to die for what you did to Naboth. And the dogs are going to lap up your blood of the same place they lapped up Naboth's. You know that calmed Ahab down for a while. He behaves himself for a little while. But we find over in 1 Kings chapter 22 that he has sort of forgotten about what is the, this uh, warning he has received. And you know what Ahab's doing? He's plotting a war. Ahab has uh, got old King Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's king of Judah. Ahab, uh, he, uh, he is the king of Israel. And we find out they're planning a war. I don't know about you, but if I had the death penalty hanging over me, I wouldn't be plotting a war. But that's what they're doing. They're going to go up against Ramoth Gilead. That's her neighbor. And they're going to take away Ramoth Gilead. And they're plotting this war. And uh, they bring in, back in those days, they brought in prophets to predict how the war is going. And uh, Ahab has um, the prophets come in. And he's got, I don't know how, I don't, I don't understand this. Ahab has got 400 prophets. What do you do? You take the average. They come in and Ahab said, how's the war going? And they all said, now they know, they know which side their toast was buttered on. They said, go get them. You're going to win. Go get them. Go get him. And Jehoshaphat's probably like I was. Uh, he was a little bit intimidated by 400 prophets. And he asked, uh, he asked Ahab, don't you have some more prophets? More. He wants more prophets. And Ahab said, matter of fact, I got another one. Uh, this other one though I hate him I hate this prophet now this is 1 Kings chapter 22 and he said uh, this other prophet is Micaiah and uh, Jehoshaphat said why do you say that why do you talk about him like that and Ahab said he never tells me anything good he doesn't tell me anything I, I want to know and Jehoshaphat said don't say that just call him in here so they went and got Micaiah. Now he's already heard what's happening. He's already received information from God. And he comes in and Joseph had said, or Ahab, one of them, said, how's the war going? And Micaiah said, go get them, you're going to win. And Ahab said, I've told you not to talk to me like that. Now how's it going to go? And you know, I really do like this part. 
uh, Micaiah translates this into the kindest terms you could put it. He tells Ahab, I saw Israel scattered on the mountain like sheep without a shepherd. How could you make that any easier? He didn't say, go out there and die a slow, rotten death. He didn't tell him that. He said, I saw Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd. You know what that means? A shepherd's going to get killed. Well, Ahab says, throw him back in the dungeon on bread and water, and he got ready to go to battle. But now he's not fully involved. Instead of dressing out like the king usually does, he dressed up like a common soldier. No, no fancy stuff on him. And he gets in a chariot, and he goes to war against Ramoth Gilead. Now, I don't know if y'all are aware of this. Back in Bible days, they had groups of soldiers like Green Berets and Seals and those kind of people. They had those kind of people. And the king of Ramoth Gilead, he had his own little Green Berets. And he told them, listen, I want you to go down there and don't do anything except kill Ahab. So they're patrolling up and down the battle line. You know, back in those days, they just stood toe-to-toe and hacked it out. And that's what's happening. And now then we find out that they're looking for Ahab. And they can't find him. He's going to get away with this, isn't he? He's, he's going to escape this judgment that God has given him. No, he's not. And this is the part that's good. There's a little soldier from Ramoth Gilead who goes to battle with a sack full of arrows. And he knows he better not carry a sack full of arrows back home. So he's firing these arrows out into the crowd. I used to say random. Well, they're all random but one. And one of these arrows strikes Ahab. Let me read it to you. Verse 34 of chapter 22 of 1 Kings. A certain man drew a bow at a venture. Now if you've got a Bible with a marginal reading, at a venture means in his simpleness. Here's this little guy out there and he's just shooting him out in the crowd. And smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness, whereof he, he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. This little guy shooting arrows out in the crowd. One of these arrows goes between the joints of Ahab's armor and mortally wounds him. He tells his driver, get me back to the house. He's bleeding to death. They made a mad run for the house, the palace. And when they got there, Ahab was dead. Did anybody expect anything else? Do you think he's going to get away with this? You know better than that. He knew what he should do. He wasn't going to do it. And he paid the penalty. We find that to take Ahab out of the chariot, pulled the chariot outside of the gates of the city, and washed out his blood, and the dogs came and lapped it up. And that's the way that it works. So what's the, what's the message here? Don't try to escape the judgments of God. Don't even think about it. Now we've got two judgments. In Hebrews 9 verse 27, the Bible says it's appointed a man wants to die and after this a judgment. What are we going to do? We're going to die and we're going to be judged. You believe that? Well, that's what's going to happen. Whether you believe that or not. That's what the Bible tells us and we know we're going to die and we're going to be judged. Now you can be deluded about this if you want to. For instance, the idea of dying. There are many people who reject the idea of dying. Uh, This is not something for them. Death is for everybody else. I think young people especially get involved in this. They think death is for old people. And you know it is more old people that dies than younger people. Uh, But I need to tell you something about that. In my years of preaching, I preached a whole bunch of funerals. A lot of funerals. And the oldest... Christian that I ever preached a funeral for was 99 years old. I'd known her. She lived over at McAllister, by the way, and I'd known her all my life, and she was laid out here in her casket, and she was, even in death, she's a sweet-looking little old woman, pleasant-looking, if you can say that about a dead person. And I looked at her, and I thought, 99 years, that's a long time. She'd lived to be 99 years old. And now, she had met her appointment. She was dead. Death does affect old people, probably as we said, more than usual for young people. 
But let me tell you one other thing before I leave this. Just enough, just often enough, I have stood before a little casket just about that long. Several times. And that little person in that little casket was just as dead as that 99-year-old woman. Death's not just for old people. And I could cite to you, and you know enough, I want to tell you this, and because this is personal and this is home, there's a little town south of Ada called Tishomingo. About a month ago now, there was um, six young high school girls got their lunch break, and they got in a little bitty car, and they pulled out of the schoolyard to go down to this little restaurant. And when they pulled out in the intersection, uh, six, uh, an 18 wheeler truck ran over them and killed all of them. It was horrible. Tishomingo just had about 6,000 population, and here's six of them dead. Uh, whatever history they could have had, whatever things they could have done, is jerked out from under them like a rug. And they're all dead. They range from ages 13 up to 17. Young. See, it's not always for old people. So what you don't want to do is allow yourself to be deceived into thinking you've got plenty of time. Our death is something, as we said, for old people. It's not necessarily so. Last of all, judgment. Judgment. We live in a generation that does not want to be accountable for anything. They want to lay everything off on somebody else. And that's very common. We got uh, no fault insurance. We got no fault divorces. We got no fault, no fault. Uh, nobody wants to answer for the what happens. But I want to assure you, we're all going to be judged. And the righteous judge is going to be Jesus Christ. And there'll be no fix in your trial. There'll be no bind the judge. You're going to get righteous judgment. Romans 14, 14 verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Again, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it's evil. He's going to bring it all out in judgment. Do you believe that? Well, that's what the Bible says. And you can read it all over the Bible. I just picked two places. Uh, we know that's going to happen. Now, you can resist that, I suppose. And you can try to avoid it. This happened to me um, a few years back. I used to get a magazine. Uh, it was a field and stream type magazine. That's not what it was, but it was about hunting and fishing. And there was a famous big game hunter that wrote an article in this magazine every month. And I could just hardly wait to get the magazine to read about his uh, expeditions around the world in uh, pursuit of all kinds of big game. Well, one month I got the magazine and it had on the outside of it a black cover. It was all black. And I thought, something's happened here. Sure enough, I opened the cover and it was my man, this big game hunter. He had died. And I read through it and got to the last and had his obituary in the last pages. And here's what he asked for. He asked to have his body cremated. Burned up into a minor amount of ashes. He wanted them to charter a plane and fly out over the Brooks Range of mountains up in Alaska. One of the few real wild places left on earth. And scatter his ashes to the winds and the snow on the ice of the Brooks Range. And I thought, what's that about? Something's, that's bad to think that. It wasn't two weeks. I got another, this is in the newspaper, a Hollywood actor had died that I'd known and watched him on sitcoms a lot of my, a lot of my life. He had died. And he wanted his body cremated. I want whatever you want to make out of that. He wanted his body burned up. And he'd made arrangements to charter an airplane to fly out from, you know, that sign on the hill in, out there in California that says Hollywood. He wanted them to fly out over that mountain and get out there over the Pacific Ocean and dump his ashes to the water and the wind. And I thought, there it is again. It wasn't a week this time that I got a 
I noticed something either on the news or in a paper. This lady psychologist who studies human behavior, she wrote about that process. She said the people who have themselves burned up uh, have their ashes scattered. They either consciously or unconsciously believe that when God signals judgment, He can't find them. That's awful, isn't it? Wouldn't you hate to be so terrified of judgment that you'd just like to annihilate yourself and wash yourself off for never ever again? You might like that idea, but that's not going to happen. Not only is that something which God has, uh, has whoever that is already in his, under His control, uh, their spirits are His, and what they do to their body is not going to matter at all. But the terrible thing is how scared they are, how afraid they are. And they hope, this little lady said, that they can escape judgment. Not going to happen. You're not going to escape judgment. I'm ready to close for this evening. How do you avoid a delusion? Never resist the truth. Always obey it when you have the opportunity. Never speak evil of the truth. And never disobey the things that you know to do. Do not neglect it in any way. And you won't have to be concerned about a strong delusion. When you know what the Bible teaches, do it. Now you can probably find excuses, but those excuses are not going to matter uh, when the time comes for you to answer for your life. Uh, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we put it on the board a minute ago, here's what you need to do. John 8 verse 24, Jesus said that we must believe in Him. Are we going to die in our sins? You probably believe that. That's probably something that you're aware of. We have to believe in Jesus Christ. Look again. Luke 13 verse 3 said, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. How could God expect to save us if we don't want to change? You have to repent. Matthew 10 at verse 32, Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. What is that confession? It's like the eunuch made in Acts 8 at verse 37 when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Folks, I've been doing this for a long time. And there's nothing that gives me any more satisfaction or any more joy to my heart than to hear somebody, especially some young person, that'll stand up and all the courage and all the determination they have say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have to do that. What else? we pointed out the need for baptism. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Do you see that? If you see that tonight and that's something you need to do, why don't you do that? If there's a child of God here and you need to make some correction in your Christian life, if we can assist you, we'll be glad to do so. Want to be the class, won't you come while we...